Welcome to the Federalist Society's webinar call. Today, December 15th, we discuss a litigation update, the OSHA vaccine mandate. My name is Guy DeSanctis, and I'm Assistant Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. Today, we are fortunate to have with us our moderator, R. Pepper Crutcher, a partner at Balkan Bingham, LLP, and chairman of the Federalist Society's Labor and Employment Law Practice Group. Throughout the panel, if you have any questions, please submit them through the question and answer feature or the chat so that our speakers will have access to them for when we get to that portion of the webinar. With that, thank you for being with us today. Pepper, the floor is yours. Thank you, Guy. And we are presenting this on behalf of both the Federal Society Labor and Employment Practice Section and the Administrative Law Section. And our first speaker will be Paul Larkin from the Administrative Law Section. Paul is a Rumpel Senior Legal Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. He received his law degree from Stanford Law School. He's held numerous positions in the federal government, including an assistant to the Solicitor General of the Justice Department. He's authored two articles on the Biden administration's vaccine mandates that will be published in January 2022. Uh, when we put this up on the website, let's try to include those citations. He's also the author of an article on the CDC eviction moratorium, the Sturm and Drang of the CDC's home eviction moratorium. 44 Harvard Law Journal, Public Policy, 2021. Also speaking on behalf of the Labor and Employment section will be Larry Stein. Larry is a senior principal in the Labor and Employment Law Firm of Wimberley, Lawson, Steckel, Schneider, and Stein in Atlanta, Georgia. He's a former regional counsel for OSHA. He specializes in OSHA and wage and hour matters. Larry is co-author of two nationally recognized books, available on westlaw.com. One is Wage and Hour Law, Compliance and Practice and Procedures, and the other is Occupational Safety and Health Law, Compliance and Practice. Larry has handled the largest OSHA case with about 4,800 citation items and has been litigating OSHA cases since 1975. Um, viewers, this is how this is going to work. Paul will start off with about 10 minutes explaining to us the current litigation status of the OSHA Emergency Temporary Standard on COVID vaccination and testing. Then Larry will tell us what is the practical import for employers. That is, what does the standard require employers to do and how are employers adjusting? About 10 minutes each, then I'll have a few questions and then we'll let speakers talk to each other if they want about points each raise. And then we'll open the uh, floor for questions from the audience. You can use your chat function to ask those questions or you can ask those questions live as you prefer. Recently, most people have been using the chat functions and we'll direct those questions to speakers as you choose or if you don't choose to them both for comment. Um, Paul, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the kind words and I appreciate the opportunity the Federalist Society has offered to try to give some people an update about where this litigation stands. And litigation, it definitely is. Uh, once the OSHA mandate went into effect, numerous parties in various courts around the country brought suit in the circuit courts to try to have the mandate set aside. It's an unusual way to litigate these sorts of cases for people who are more accustomed to going immediately to a district court rather than to a circuit court, but that's the way Congress intended this to work. I suppose if there were factual issues that needed to be developed for one reason or another, the uh, circuit court could send it to a district court for that. But right now we start out in the intermediate appellate courts. It began first in the Fifth Circuit because the Fifth Circuit acted very quickly. The Fifth Circuit entered an interim stay, allowing the parties to be confident that nothing would change unless and until there was full briefing on the issue. And then after briefing on it, the CA-5 entered a stay pendente lite pending the remainder of the litigation. Because there were numerous courts involved, since there were filings in all sorts of courts in addition to the CA-5, the Judicial Panel on Multi-District Litigation consolidated all the litigation in one circuit court and effectively transferred jurisdiction over the merits of the case from the CA-5 and all the other courts to the CA-6. Now that the case is in the CA-6, uh, the government has gone back in and asked the CA-6 to lift or modify the injunction that the CA-5 imposed and has been further rounds of briefing in that regard. That briefing they 
additional briefing necessary to respond to the government's new motion is now complete. And so the CA-6 is, as an old professor and former colleague at the uh, Justice Department once told me, the CA-6 is now seized of the case. And what we have is a situation where we're waiting for them to hear. I checked uh, Fox News before this event to see if the CA-6 had entered an order on the government's motion. And as of yet, there has been no such uh, decision. I expect that the CA-6 will try to act quickly uh, because if it were to disagree with the CA-5 and modify the stay, uh, or if there were a two to one decision and someone were writing a dissent, uh, the court would still want to get this disposed of quickly. So it could be set up to then move on to the merits. At that point, the CA-6 will probably yet again expedite its consideration of this because the government wanted these uh, mandates to go into effect Im- immediately upon the issuance of this rule. That's why it's called an emergency temporary standard. Uh, and postponing it would, in effect, uh, nullify the opportunity that OSHA has to try to protect the public uh, upfront and immediately. So. The bottom line is this, the original order entered by the CA-5 is still in effect. The case is now, however, in the jurisdiction of the CA-6, which is considering the government's motion to eliminate or to modify in some way the injunction that the CA-5 entered. I expect the CA-6 will act expeditiously on that motion and then expeditiously again on the merits of the issue, as to which there are two principal issues that are going to come up. One is, uh, as a question of administrative law, is this ETS within the authority of OSHA to issue? Another is, even if OSHA has the authority, whether its decision was arbitrary and capricious. There will also be constitutional challenges raised to the issue, assuming that OSHA has the authority to do it and that its rule is not arbitrary. Uh, But those would only be disposed of if the court at the outset decides that OSHA has the authority to do this. The government lost when it had similar litigation over the CDC home eviction moratorium. And in my opinion, I think it's likely to lose again because OSHA does not have the authority to do this. As a practical matter, uh, the government may have decided not to try to go back to the Department of Health and Human Services for it to come up with a source of authority since the government lost in the CDC litigation. But in truth, if any federal agency had the authority, it'd be one of the health-related agencies, like HHS in general, or the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, or CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Those are the agencies that Congress has traditionally entrusted with medical judgments in this regard, and Congress has never given them the authority to impose a vaccination mandate. It's odd, therefore, in the extreme for OSHA to be doing this. And I think it's probably just as a result of a judgment that they went to the HHS well before it didn't work and they shouldn't try to go back. That being said, what I would now like to do is turn it back to you, Pepper, so that you can hand it over to Larry, because Larry now will be able to fill people in on what is now happening and what will happen to the businesses out there who have to comply with this either now or if it's later upheld. Larry? All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I get the pleasure of going through the OSHA cita- uh, regulation. There's two things going on. First is it stayed. Nobody has to do it right now, but there's a 30-day and a 60-day period so that if the Sixth Circuit says the stay's off, you've got 30 days and 60 days to implement this. The other thing that you ought to take into effect is that some of the states have state plans and can implement this regulation under state authorities, such as California. Um, Other states have dragged their feet on the old ETS standards. So we'll talk about the standard because there may be some uh, possibilities that it comes and what you need to be doing and what the standard does. And I wanna try to do that quickly in the 10 minutes I got. The uh, OSHA standard is applicable only to employers of 100 or more employees. However, just so you know, 
That can mean you got 100 remotely located employees, you're covered. There's not 100 in the establishment. It's the total number of employers you have. Now, they made some exceptions to it already. One of them is for the federal contractor uh, COVID vaccine. Those companies are exempted from it. Um, those who are covered supposedly by the, contra the Center of Medicare and Medicaid centers standards, both of which are more stringent than the OSHA ones, would be uh, uh, exempted from the OSHA standards <laughs> joined right now. Employees not working with others, those working from home and work exclusively outdoors. But do understand when they mean exclusively outdoors, they mean you don't go inside any place. You just hang around outside. And even on some of the buildings, once they're enclosed, although there's wide openings, they're, they're taking the position that's not exclusively outside. So the way the regulation is set up is you have a mandatory vaccination plan or you decide you're not going to have everybody do it and that the employees that are not vaccinated will have a weekly test and have to wear face coverings. Um, for the determination of the vaccine status, there's a couple of ways to do it. You can get a record of immunization from a healthcare professional or a pharmacy. You can get your little one-inch COVID card. You can get immunization from public health, state, or tribals. Or this is the most interesting one of all, you can have the employees attest to their status, that they've lost it or unable to produce it. Uh, the interesting thing is though they have a very specific statement for anybody that signs it. And it basically you have to have on your form, which has the information about it, is I declare, certify, verify, or state that this statement about my vaccination status is true and accurate. I understand that knowingly provide false information regarding my vaccine status on this form may subject me to criminal penalties. Um, and then in the training session, you'll hear very briefly, you're instructed to train them about the criminal provisions of 18 U.S.C. 1001 and 17 G of the OSHA Act. Uh, if I was an employer, though, I think I would have a little stack of attestation forms ready for those employees who want to sign it and claim they haven't done it. The OSHA will accept those as being vaccinated. If you don't prove it, then you've got to be um, tested weekly. Um, and you have to keep these records pursuant to another OSHA regulation, which is 29 CFR 1910-1020, which treats them as medical records. And basically, if you think of HIPAA and, and the privacy aspects of it, you have to keep it to a very narrow group of people. But you don't have to retain it for as long as those regulations require just as long as this regulation stays in effect, however long that may, that may be. Um, the, the interesting thing about the testing is one of the things they do allow is employee self-testing, but they don't allow employee self-testing and self-verification. So in talking to some of the uh, companies that are trying to figure out what to do this, because the self-test kits are the cheapest, they are going to proctor self-test. So they're going to go in and let the employees go ahead and do the self-test and stick a, a Q-tip up their nose and put it in there and then hand it over to the employer so that it's a self-test, but it's not self-verification. And those that is allowable. And that may be the cheapest way uh, the companies can do it. Some of them which have clinics are proposing to have their clinics, but a lot of us will just have to wait to see what the employees get. One of the most interesting thing about the OSHA standard is OSHA almost never, ever makes the employee pay for anything they require. But on this particular standard, they made an exception to their general rule, and they will allow you to charge the employee for the weekly testing. And in the federal register that talks about it, they were quite honest. They said that they wanted to do that because it might encourage the employees to get vaccinated. So the whole purpose of allowing employers to make the employees do it is for the purpose that it really was designed for is to force the employees to be vaccinated. If the employees do not do the testing and do not have the vaccination, they're not allowed in the workplace. Now, the regulations are coy. They don't say you got to fire them. They just say you can't let them come to work. So 
you, you tell me what the result is. If I can't let an employee come to work, uh, what you're going to do, you're going to, at a, at a minimum, suspend them without pay uh, while they are not doing either one of them. But uh, we expect a lot of those folks will just quit and go to smaller employers. Um, also in the act is a requirement to pay for vaccinations up to four hours of their regular uh, pay and paid sick leave to recover if they have side effects from the vaccination. Um, the testing every seven days, documentation to do seven days after that. Uh, and by, the interesting thing is if you get a positive test, you get 90 days off from testing. But after 90 days, you got to start testing again, even if you've had COVID, which is their rejection of the um, natural immunities, which they reject in the federal register. If you get a positive result, you have to leave, and that includes the people who are vaccinated, uh, until you get a negative nuclear acid amplification test, which is lovely, or you follow the CDC guidelines, or you get a return to work by the healthcare professional. But the employees are not required to pay for the COVID times. Even if you're vaccinated, they don't have to. They also required to wear the mask, uh, which are either surgical mask or masks that are a little bit more than just a um, bandana around your face. There's actually a definition in it. And you can take it off when you're alone in a fully enclosed room, eating or drinking, or you're wearing a respirator, or you can prove it's a greater hazard. As to the training, that they, you have to tell them what the standard is. You got to hand out a CDC booklet. Key things to know about the COVID-19 vaccine. I want to tell you when you hand these things out that I would recommend that you have a trash can that is empty of all trash so that as the employees go by and dump the booklets in the trash can, you can retrieve them to hand them out to the next group because my experience is going to be those CD, CDC booklets are going to go in the trash can as they walk out the door, but that's what it requires. And you're required to tell them about the retaliation provisions. And as I noted before, the criminal provisions of 18 U.S.C. 1001 and 17 G. Now, that was a eight minute summary of the regulation. I don't think I could do it any quicker than that, but um, I, I'm done with my my 10 minutes on the OSHA regs. All right, uh, Larry, um, since you've got two minutes left, let me ask you a question that might occur to some of our viewers who might have looked at the record. By the way, the Sixth Circuit case number is 21-7000, for those of you who might want to go on place and look at it. Uh, OSHA said in its briefing, hey, look, this is not a big deal. This is certainly not unprecedented. Look at our biohazard rule. Uh, Larry, could you explain the biohazard rule a little bit for the people watching this who might not have ever practiced before OSHA? Well, what, what they have in the regulations, and, and they use it for like lead, cadmium, there are some medical removal provisions so that if something happens to an employee, they will remove them from workplace for lead. If their blood levels exceed 50 micrograms per milliliter, you have to remove them from work, but you have to pay them. Uh, also in there, the only other thing that comes remotely close to a vaccine is in the bloodborne pathogen regulations they do have a provision for hepatitis B vaccinations. But the interesting thing, what they did in the Federal Register, they said, we will not make them do it. And they have a declination form in the regulations that allow the employees to decline that hepatitis B vaccination. So I think that's an answer to your question, Pepper. Okay. Larry, do you have any questions for Paul? Paul, do you have any questions for Larry before I ask mine? I just have one for, for Larry. Larry, Given the fact that uh, OSHA, when they came out with this rule, didn't get an uh, increase in the number of FTEs to go around the country and conduct inspections, uh, is, is the administration essentially relying on uh, people at work to dime out their boss about whether these things are actually being implemented? Well, yeah, that's that basically the problem is the OSHA staffs in each state is relatively small. I think in the state of Georgia, where we have 10 million people, we have 34 investigators. Uh, they, they can never get everywhere. Um, so they're relying on complaints and going in and uh, checking on that. And um, it would be extraordinarily difficult for OSHA to actually be able to enforce 
this regulation, my expectations is what they would do is they would find one or two employees they investigate who are basically just giving the finger, so to speak, and completely reviewing it and try to hit them with the hardest penalty as they can and get publicity, uh, which is kind of their normal way. If they get something, they want to kind of scare everybody because if we pick you, we're going to hit you with a multiple hundred thousand dollars of fine and don't let, us, don't let us find you in the same situation. That would be my expected enforcement um, policies for OSHA because they do not have the resources. So we're now to uh, the moderator's questions and I'll be quick about this so we can get to the uh, building up questions we have from the audience. Uh, Paul, when OSHA published this in the Federal Register on November 5th, they published it both as an emergency temporary standard and as an APA final rule. They could have as early as December 6th announced that the ETS has been superseded by what has now become a final rule. Um, is there a reason, do you think that they have not done that? Uh, and is it something they still might do? As to why they, they have not withdrawn the ETS and gone forward with it just as a final rule, I think they're just trying to keep uh, you know, hope alive that the courts will eventually either rule in their favor or that they can postpone the litigation long enough for more people to get vaccinated. Uh, as to whether they should do that, you know, that depends on what their motivation for doing this and the beginning is. I mean, when you look at this, it seems to me that in all likelihood, the administration re realizes it's going to lose in this litigation. It lost badly in the Supreme Court in the Alabama Realtors case because they tried to cram into a statute that didn't remotely address landlord tenant relations authority to interfere in state law in this regard. If the, this case goes back up to the Supreme Court, I think the Supreme Court is likely again to say that OSHA, the administration, doesn't have authority to do this. The administration should have gone to Congress for this authority. So why didn't they? Well, there are at least three reasons why they didn't. One is the president wants to be seen as doing something. He promised the country he would uh, end this problem. And with all the variations we now have, it certainly hasn't ended. But more importantly, he, if he uh, focuses what everybody is looking at on the number of vaccinations rather than on the number of people who are now immunized, he can focus everybody's attention on outputs rather than outcomes. And for a politician, that's important. You can measure outputs. Outcomes are a lot more difficult to measure. Take law enforcement. You can measure the number of arrests, the number of charges, the number of convictions, the number of fines. You can't as easily measure the effect on the crime rate from anything you do. Same thing here. I agree with Larry that what's going to happen is if somebody is uh, turned in by an employee and OSHA can, they will probably hammer that company just to show that uh, they're doing something in this regard. The uh, politicians like to see good things done, but they even more like to, to see good things done that they can uh, take credit for. Uh, and if they can take credit for any uh, improvement in the number of vaccinations, they'll say they did their best. Plus, the government has stepped in to be the bad cop uh, for all the employers that want to do this on their own, uh, and they get to be the, the good cop. The employers can say, you know, I wouldn't have required this for my employees, but the government's making me do it. So the government wants to be able to be the bad cop for as long as it can. Uh, and, you know, if nothing else, they can just kick the can down the road. Uh, until the litigation is finalized, they can still hold over the head of everyone the threat of some sort of penalty, as Larry talked about. But those are those three reasons are political justifications, not legal ones. And I think politics is what's driving the train here, not law. Well, legally, um, is it true that if OSHA withdrew the ETS because it had been uh, superseded by what's now become a final rule under the APA? that action would moot the current proceedings in the Sixth Circuit? Is, is that the case? Not necessarily, because keep in mind that what happened was you had 
uh, lawsuits brought around the nation and the parties are certainly going to ask the court to retain jurisdiction over this because all they're doing is changing the label that they put on these requirements. You know, the the opportunity that the statute gave them to impose an emergency temporary standard didn't change their need to show that they had authority to do this or that it wasn't arbitrary and capricious. If the CA6 were to say, well, we're vacating the ETS because OSHA doesn't have the statutory authority to do this, that ruling would cover the final rule as well as the ETS. So the parties are going to probably want to make sure that they don't get jerked around by OSHA in doing this all over again from scratch. Larry, do you have anything to say in response to Paul's comments about that? Well, it. The, the problem is, in part, is that OSHA did something we've never seen before, is they had an issue of COVID-19, and they issued a ETS on June 21st, 2021, limited to the healthcare workers without vaccine mandates and without testing and having safety protocols. And then a few months later, all of a sudden, they're changing their entire mind and they got some real issues internally because of the change of their positions. Because, well, what happened between June 21 when OSHA decided the healthcare workers who were the most closest to the COVID didn't need vaccine and didn't need testing. And November when they issued, November 5th, when they issued the new ETS. And of course the answer is on September the 9th, Joe Biden got on TV and says, we're gonna do this. And um, that quote has been uh, duplicated in every COVID vaccine case I have seen so far, the Sixth Circuit, the, uh, the the CMS ones in the Eastern District of Louisiana, and the contractor ones in the Southern District of Georgia. Um, okay, question, question for you, you again, Larry. Um, I've been watching the Safer Federal Workforce website and the Office of Personal, Personnel Management website, and I think I have noticed that federal agency employers who are covered by their own presidential vaccine mandate um, appear to be slow walking employee terminations for employees who are not vaccinated. Will OSHA allow employers subject to the ETS or the final rule to do the same or will OSHA take a different approach, do you think? Well, it depends on which one, but for the OSHA ETS, the 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 difference, Pepper, is there is a testing requirement so that I can continue to have unvaccinated employees as long as I'm testing them weekly. Now, I don't know how many people are going to leave because I'm shoving a Q-tip up their nose once a week or they're having to do it themselves. But the the issue with the federal employees and with the, the other two COVID vaccines, there's no out. You're the vaccinated, you're not. But, well... Will the employer slow walk? The answer is yeah. I, I guarantee you the employers will slow walk it because, well, as you know, as an employment lawyer and as I know, I don't have a client that's fully staffed. I've, I've talked to poultry plants and I've asked them how short are they in employees? And then we're talking about unskilled workers. They're telling me 50, 100, 150 openings in the plant. And they're, they're having to cut down on that. And the same thing's true with almost everybody in the country is the employees are putting a real lovely Hobson's choice. I lose employees, I lose capacity. How in the world are I going to do it? The federal government is no different. They're facing uh-huh. the same dilemma. And as you noted on the Wall Street Journal yesterday, a whole bunch of hospitals that had put the vaccine mandate in were very quick to withdraw them because they were losing employees and were having labor shortages. Yeah, I'll, I'll share with our audience something that I share with you in preparation for this uh, meeting. There's an employer with about 15, 16,000 employees. It's in a manufacturing type business that for six months in 2021 ran a promotion promising to pay a bonus of $1,000 to anyone who would show proof of vaccination who hadn't already been vaccinated. And now this is a thousand dollars for people who are making counting benefits somewhere between fifteen and twenty-five dollars an hour. That's a lot of money for those people. They thereby raise their vaccination percentage from thirty-seven to forty-one percent. Yeah. Uh, there is some serious hardcore resistance to becoming vaccinated 
in that population of employees, which is causing employers to fear that if forced to be vaccinated, they will quit. All right, let's, uh, let's open our uh, question from the floor. A um, lot of questions I'm seeing about, uh, will the Sixth Circuit address this as a panel or will they do so uh, en banc uh, from the first ruling? That sounds like a Paul Larkin question. Paul, what do you think? Well, it all turns on whether the full CA6 would like to have three judges look at it first. Uh, why does the Supreme Court wait to allow an issue to percolate before the Supreme Court takes it up? Because it wants to get as many valuable opinions as possible on what the correct answer is. If the CA6 judges think that there is no benefit to waiting to see what a panel does, they'll vote to hear it on bunk. If, however, enough of the judges think, no, I'd like to have my colleagues take a first crack at this, then they won't. So it's it, it all turns on how much help each of the CA6 judges think they want or need before actually casting a vote on the map. Um, good question that I think is in your wheelhouse, Larry. So the employer makes employees pay for their testing at a very low wage level and a high enough test charge that could suppress employees pay below minimum wage for the work week if the employer isn't allowed to credit um, itself for the cost of testing that it charged the employee. Is that an FLSA problem? Uh, without a doubt is an FLSA problem because pursuant to the regulations, I'm requiring you to go get a test at your own cost. Oh, she can say I can do it, but you can't let that cut on, underneath the minimum wage. So to the extent that the cost of the test drops them below the minimum wage, it's a Fair Labor Standards Act violation without a doubt. Uh, another good question um, from Robert Fitzpatrick is, um, how is the whistleblower section of the OSH Act uh, going to factor in this, do you think, Larry? Well, uh, that is a little bit more complicated question than you think. OSHA issued a re uh, regulation that incorporated the retaliation provisions, which are also found in 11C, which 11C has the shortest charge period of any statute on the face of the earth. You got to file your charge in 30 days. And so what the, the OSHA is trying to do, the secretary is trying to do, is he puts them in a citation to issue a citation that goes beyond the, the uh, statutory protections that Congress put in there. I, nobody's challenged it yet because OSHA hasn't had the uh, nerve yet to issue a citation under that particular regulation because I think they probably know they're going to run into a, this is a violation, you're not following your own statutory provisions. Um, the other part of the retaliation is you got to tell everybody, but uh, they're being told so much now about the retaliation. I think it's practically white noise. <laughs> Jeffrey Wood is asking a good question. It sounds like one for you, Paul. Um, does, does OSHA have something at risk in this litigation more than just this particular standard? Is there a potential that the Sixth Circuit or the Supreme Court will do something that materially um, circumscribes what OSHA can do in the future? because of this case? Absolutely. Government agencies have certain authority. Some of it's clear, some of it is hazy. It's often to their advantage to have that haziness out there because from their perspective, it allows them to get things done without having to go to court. Every time a court limits what an agency can do, the agency's authority becomes less hazy at the periphery and more distinct. And by virtue of the fact the court has limited them, it limits the agency's ability to engage in jawboning or threatening uh, to try to get things done. I'm sure the CDC didn't like the fact that they were ordered essentially to issue a new rule, even though the Supreme Court had politely said that you couldn't have an eviction moratorium without authority from Congress to do it. Why? Because the CDC is used to getting what it wants. The same as the FDA. You tell somebody to do something, somebody will generally go along with what the agency demands because they're afraid, first of all, of the adverse publicity, but secondly, they're afraid they might lose in court. Well, every time an agency loses in court 
when it's trying to expand its authority, it loses the ability to get things done without going to court. Same is true here. If the Supreme Court smacks down the administration for what they're doing here, that's a limitation that is going to affect OSHA in all sorts of other cases. And so, yes, I, you know, somebody in OSHA probably volunteered this as a way of saying, well, this is the best we can do to try to help the president get done what he wants to get done. But, you know, that's probably somebody high up who's a, you know, possible political appointee. All the people that have to deal with businesses on a daily basis and who try to engage in this, you know, strong arming or jawboning, whatever, however you want to describe it, they're probably not happy that now they're in litigation over this because they feel if they lose, it's going to hurt them and everything else they do. Uh, Larry, you've got a question that looks like it's uh, probably for you. Uh, there are accommodations available in the Federal Register publication of ETS for religion and disability, right? And if so, um, how much wiggle room does that give to employers and employees? Yeah, there, there, there is in the OSHA ETS medical and religious accommodation. And of course, what I have been telling my clients is that, that I'm going to be exceedingly liberal on my religious accommodations. Uh, in other words, if it passed the smell test, because if I rule against them and end up firing them, I could end up with a Title VII religious discrimination case. But if I let them stay and it's I, they've got something there and I give it to them, OSHA is highly unlikely with the limited resources they're going to have in enforcing this to ever even look at that particular issue. So I would be very liberal in how I granted religious accommodations and medical exceptions uh, on that because one, I can end up with a lawsuit if I deny one and on the other one, I don't think OSHA is gonna be in the business of litigating religious accommodations. They, they have no authority, they have no knowledge and they'll be out, fish out of bowl of water, so. Uh, Paul, what, a uh, uh, couple of uh, people are asking this, what does this case have, um, uh, in store, perhaps for yet another change in Chevron deference or in whatever is left of our deference after Kaiser? Well, part of it will turn on whether or not the government pushes that theory. Uh, so far in the pleadings that I've read that the government has filed, they haven't made an argument that whether or not the statute permits this, Chevron certainly does. So if the government doesn't make the argument, that reduces the likelihood that the CA-6 will address it on its own. Doesn't mean the CA-6 won't. And if the CA-6 does, uh, it could say that were there no Chevron deference, we would, of course, give uh, no deference to OSHA's interpretation here. The CA-6 could try to make this into a Chevron claim, uh, a Chevron case, but you know, the government is being very careful, I think, to try to avoid that because I think they realize these cases are not good vehicles to try to defend Chevron in this regard. Um, so, Larry, here's a question that Jerome Penn asks to you directly, and I'll quote him. Can you briefly explain why OSHA lacks the authority to mandate vaccination when it has the authority to mandate many other active safety measures? designed to reduce illness, close quote. Okay, yeah, I, I can answer that there's two reasons for it. One of them is a statutory interpretation. Believe it or not, in the Occupational Safety and Health Act, there is authority for immunizations. It's in a section that gives a limited authority to the secretary of HHS when they're doing studies and reports on looking at different um, impacts of substances that they could require vaccines, but they're required to pay it. So under the statutory interpretation, when you give limited authority, that limits their authority, you don't get any more general authority. So there's actually a very specific, very limited authority. So we don't have it in there. The other problem is that the immunization is really not directed to workplace safety. OSHA's authority is for workplace safety. And what they're really doing is they're looking at public health cases. And there's a provision in the OSHA Act that says that if um, you're not a state plan, you're a federal plan, you, the state can issue workplace safety. And some of the very creative lawyers, as we all are, 
uh, were arguing when they got cited from the state in a public health standard in one of those states. You can't do that anymore because OSHA has preempted you and all the courts universally had said, no, this is a community public health. OSHA's preemption is limited to workplace safety. So that's the reason why OSHA doesn't, it lacks the authority just to require vaccinations because it's trying to do a public health that doesn't have the authority and the courts are so fine. And in the act has provided extremely limited authority for immunizations in a very narrow circumstance. Pepper, Pepper, if I could, I'd like to just add to what Larry said. One is uh, point is that the section where the term immunization shows up basically shows up as a way of saying that if immunizations are required, uh, you can't discriminate against someone on the basis of a religious objection. Well, that doesn't grant authority to OSHA to require immunizations. It just says if there are immunizations, you can't discriminate against people. It doesn't give you the authority to do this to begin with. Plus, Immunizations are materially different from the type of other requirements that OSHA can establish. If you have to wear goggles, if you have to wear a safety helmet, if you have to wear a gown, gloves, whatever, you can get rid of them at the end of the day. Vaccinations are materially different. They work only if they cross the skin, enter the body, and trigger a reaction in the immune system. You can throw away a gown at the end of the day. You can't throw away T cells. You have that Im immunity that you now have is the result of a biochemical process that the body's immunological system creates to protect you in case things cross the, the skin barrier and get to one of the organs that are below. OSHA is allowed to protect you against the hazards that external types of protection can deal with gloves, masks, hats, et cetera. Immunizations are entirely different. Congress has always, since the Biologics Act of 1902, entrusted decisions in that regard to the health agencies, to HHS or some component. And Congress didn't grant HHS this authority. If it had, the president would have just told the secretary of HHS to make it so, make sure everybody is ordered to be vaccinated. The reason they went to OSHA is they couldn't find the statute uh, that allowed HHS to do this. Uh, John Scheller has a question that sounds like it's for Larry. Uh, is the COVID test that you talk about, and let's, let's focus on what you thought employers might do, is do proctored self-testing in the workplace. Right. Would that, would that be... A, uh, a case of an employer mandated medical exam under the Americans with Disabilities Act? Um, it, it would be, it falls into the exception of required for the job. For example, on the respirators, employers can require employees to take a pulmonary function test to determine whether they can use the respirator. And that's allowed under the ADA as, as required by business necessity. So, if the standard sticks and you got to do it, it's business necessity and it'll fall into that business necessity exception of the ADA. Answer that question. All right. But you'd still have to keep the records of that testing confidential. Do you have some, those records are complete confidential. They're, they're governed by what's the 1910, 1020, which limits it's, it's kind of like OSHA's version of HIPAA. Uh, who's, who can handle it? Who can disclose it? How it's disclosed? All of those things. A lot of a lot of attorneys just shorthand saying HIPAA applies to employers. Technically, it doesn't. It's 29 CFR 1910 1020 that applies to employers for the same information. I love getting uh, threat letters from plaintiffs' lawyers who almost invariably spell HIPAA H I P P A. Uh, well, and particularly with employers, it doesn't even apply. So yeah, that's that's even more fun. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Okay, a, a, a real in the weeds administrative judicial procedure question here, uh, Paul. Can judges in senior status on the Sixth Circuit vote in an en banc uh, uh, review of this? Well, I haven't checked this, the CA6's circuit rules or the circuit rules generally. I, I think that if a senior judge is on the panel, 
and the case goes in on bonk, the senior judge might be able to sit on the on bonk court because the judge was on the panel. Uh, but I, I am not otherwise not sufficiently familiar with the CA six rules or the practice in this regard to be able to give you a concrete answer. Yeah, it's, it's, it is my understanding that the initial on bonk is granted, it will be the active judges. Is my understanding of the rule. Okay. Um, so people in our audience, we have come to the li list of our questions that have been uh, put to us through chat. Uh, if you have any more, please put them up right now. It looks like we're about to use our time up just doing chat questions. So Guy, unless you think you need to open the floor uh, further, I think we'll just end with our chat questions. Uh, oh, what one person wants to know if we happen to know the status of the federal employee mandate litigation. Has the federal employee mandate been enjoined or restricted or narrowed or anything else? Not the federal, the one that they've sent to the federal employees. Right. I'm unaware of any cases. The, the ones that have been enjoined have been the uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the federal contractor ones, and the OCETS. Right. I don't know of any others. Do you, Paul? I'm not familiar with any dealing with that fourth category, the employee mandates. Uh, what I have read is that uh, the federal employee unions have object, uh, objected to this, and the administration, therefore, is maybe uh, backing off. We're, we just, we're getting chat comments from multiple viewers who are telling us that Sixth Circuit just denied en banc hearing uh, of this matter, which means it'll be su submitted to a panel. Okay. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's not a surprise. Like I say, it turns on whether or not uh, they want somebody else to look at this first. Not surprising that they would say, I'd like to get the panel will look at it because if they do a comprehensive job, then we don't need to. I mean, the CA6 judges have a lot of other things to do besides this litigation. Ladies and gentlemen, it looks like we're at the end of our chat questions and we are, we've are we been on uh, the air here for 47 minutes. I'll wait another minute or two if you want to throw in one more question. Oh, Je thank you. We did get another question again from Jeffrey Wood. Our state employees, and let's add local, county, city employees, subject to the OSHA rule, Larry? Um, the answer is going to be a real typical lawyer answer, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> the, the actual the details are is that states that agreed to enforce OSHA as one of the trade-offs that the states gave to do the OSHAs, they had to agree that the state and local and po uh, public employers would be covered by OSHA in those states. So in the states in which the federal OSHA is enforcing it, the states are exempted from OSHA and the states that enforce OSHA by their own rules, they are gonna be governed by the state's uh, OSHA regulations when they adopt them. As far as I know, South Carolina is still dragging their feet on the first ETS. Another question for Paul. Paul, one of our um, viewers says, is there any equal protection hay to be made from the fact that um, we've got a bunch of COVID vaccine mandates for various groups of people and employees, but there is apparently no effort or requirement that people coming in over the southern border be vaccinated? Is that an equal protection problem? Well, probably Technically, no, because they're not employees uh, and so aren't covered by OSHA, since what OSHA does is direct employers to make sure that people who show up uh, are either vaccinated or regularly tested. Um, atmospherically, however, it does add a great deal to the objection that all that's going on here is politics. I mean, they're requiring all sorts of people, except people who enter the country illegally to uh, be vaccinated or tested. And if they're not requiring people who come in illegally to be vaccinated or tested, you got to ask why. And that's because the president is trying to, you know, kowtow to the, you know, the Stalinist wing of his party. Uh, that's not going to help them in court. 
uh, it's not something you can use when you, you know, are filing a motion, but as a practical matter, everybody knows that's going on. And what does that mean? That means, you know, he's trying to make the courts be the bad guys. Uh, and, you know, people in black robes, particularly the ones at Maryland Avenue, aren't particularly interested in, you know, being punching bag for a politician. So, yeah, it may not be a claim you can use here, but it's going to leave a lasting impression in the minds of the judges whom the administration has to persuade on a host of other matters. So uh, for all you viewers who might not have uh, grasped this uh, as obvious, the expression that Paul uh, Larkin just used about <laughs> the president's Stalinist allies right, <laughs> was his opinion alone and not that of the Federalist Society or the moderator or Larry Stein. However, if you have not seen the movie The Death of Stalin, you should. Um, okay, question from an anonymous attendee. Um, since a lot of COVID self-tests show the results on the test itself, and for those of you who have not ever done this, it's a little piece of cardboard that you fold over on top of the Q-tip, and then you look at the uh, bar graph uh, outside to see if you tested positive. Um, what will be the record retention requirements for that particular item? Is it good enough that you take, for example, a, a iPhone photo of that and keep that as a record, or must you actually keep that cardboard test somewhere as a record of that test. Uh, you, 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 you can scan it and save it electronically. O o OSHA doesn't have any problems with electronic records in these days and events. Oftentimes they come in, that's all I give them is electronic records and they're perfectly happy. So scan it, take a picture, put in your records and you're fine. All right. Uh, Okay, Jacob Landers is trying to ask a question. I'm trying to get to him, uh, but he's not popping. Uh, I may be running out of room on my. Well, he's uh, the question as I see it is he's one he he's losing part of the uh, transmission. Can he look at it? Re can he listen or look at it later? And I think the Fed sock will make this available for later viewing. Yes, everything you're seeing and hearing will be up on the. Uh, FedSoc website. Guy, about how long will that take to get that up? Um, likely a few days. The audio may be up by tomorrow, though. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to use up our hour. It's been our great pleasure to uh, give you this update, and please watch for this to be posted on the Federal Society website. Larry, thank you. Paul, thank you. Sure. Federal Society, both of the practice groups, thank you for letting us do this. It was my pleasure. We're adjourned. On behalf of the Federalist Society, I want to thank our experts for the benefit of their valuable time and expertise today. And I want to thank our audience for joining and participating. We also welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. As always, keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about upcoming teleform calls and virtual events. Thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned. <laughs>